Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Hansen at the Langton Research Extension Center. And it's good to be with you here today, even though technically I'm not here because I'm recording this because I had a previous meeting I had to uh, be at this morning. So basically going to talk about today is uh, some of the steps we need to uh, have a successful uh, canola crop this coming year. Uh, canola in the state this year was about 1.35 million acres, and Cavalier County generally has the highest uh, canola acres in the state with over 200,000. You see most of the canola is, um, is over the northern part of the state and some in the southwest. To start out with a successful canola crop, obviously you have to choose your varieties, and that usually happens in November and December, where a lot of the companies will have um, specials on for seed, seed pricing. And <clears throat> about that time is when the extension bulletin comes out for canola, and that's usually in November. So you can get information on the canola varieties from there. Some of the things you'll see there are this example of the Liberty Link varieties across the state and the ones that were tested. Maybe they're Liberty Link or Liberty Link Flex. Um, black laid ratings and also uh, resistance to club root and where the varieties that were tested at. Once you get into uh, some of the data tables, um, this one happens to be at Langdon, you'll see some of the same information, brand, hybrid, and type. And some of the traits you'll be most interested in are probably days to mature, plant height, also plant lodging is important. And then the yield would probably be, of course, your most important category that you're looking at with that year's and also maybe a two or three year average from previous years. Now, you can also see the data on the website, and this typically comes out would be a little bit earlier than you would get on that bulletin. And right now at NDSU, there's two websites. We have the old website, which um, will be transitioned out in a, in a matter of time here. but um, that site, you can look up canola, and then you can look up the location that you're interested in. You just click on it, then you'll get a PDF file with all the data and information that we saw in the extension bulletin. The newer website is more interactive, but kind of along the same lines, you would just pick your canola crop or maybe the location, specific location you would like to look at. And then once you get there, have the same information with variety, brand, black leg or club root resistance, the herbicide trait, um, and some of these other uh, categories, and of course yield. And here you can also print it out in a PDF format, or you can look at it different ways, such as a chart, and get a little more uh, visual content of comparing varieties. thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is canola rotations. I won't spend a lot of time on this because um, <clears throat> um, talk a little about herbicides. Brian Tanks will be talking about those shortly and disease considerations. Uh, Vincat Chopper will be talking about that as well. But essentially a few highlights, preferably two or three years between canola crops. And some of the reasons for that is um, herbicide resistant weeds have out there. If you're going from a canola to Small grain crop, obviously you're spraying with different herbicides, so it can maybe help um, <clears throat> um, with some of the herbicide resistant issues. You need to check herbicide carryover the year you're planting canola. Maybe the crop you had previously had some um, carryover issues. You need to check that out. And also keep in mind the following year after canola, there's going to be canola volunteers. And how would you control them in your following crop? Disease considerations, uh, club root. Black leg and sclerotinia are all important ones that need some time um, between crops for these um, varieties to be planted again. Um, some of the more susceptible varieties of um, canola for sclerotinia are, are sunflowers and also uh, dry beans. So some of these legume crops, soybeans or field peas, lentils, and also flax would be in there would have a better option in a canola rotation. Talk a little bit about plant establishment factors. Um, talking about seedbed preparation, 
we can uh, kind of control that soil moisture and temperature uh, not so much so but the ideal situation is to have a firm well-packed seed bed and good seed to moisture contact so we'd like to have that seed completely covered with a moist soil uh, you want to avoid hair pinning um, with a straw so we have some air that can get down in the seed and dry around the area around the seed out uh, seeding depth is important we like obviously can't control it but if you have moisture within an inch of the surface would be ideal and plant about half to one inch deep we did do a study several years ago we looked at eight locations across the state looked at planting depth of three quarter inch and an inch and a half three quarter inch across the locations averaged about 80 percent emergence inch and a half 59 percent but there was no significant yield differences between <clears throat> those different planting depths so canola can come from deeper it does compensate very well as we'll talk about in a little bit some other physical damage um, excess water you have a heavy rain in the spring could get all of a sudden that um, canola you planted an uh, inch deep maybe an inch and a half or greater just from soil washing if you get uh, both types of hard rains you can get crusting you can also get frost in the spring so it's very important after you plant obviously to evaluate the stand what you have out there and if you have to take any uh, action or replant canola equipment we have a lot, <clears throat> um, a lot of different ways you can see canola air seeders air seeder you could have a double disc drill on it or you could have uh, eagle beaks or sweeps of different uh, seed spreads or maybe you have a planter that used for corn or soybeans and you could use that maybe it's a precision planter which would uh, be even better so a lot of different options but the main thing i guess we're uh, talking about here you still want that good seed to moisture contact broadcast seeding is has been done not too much in the past it's really not recommended and it's probably one of the situations where you say it's better to be lucky than good when uh, broadcast seeding and you want to set your equipment so you have the proper uh, seeding depth whether you're you're on the wings or you're behind the tractor or in a wheel track um, get and have good seed to soil contact and all your rows anyone you watch your speed don't go fast you may get a little more variability or watch your air speed on your air seeders as well seeding date is very important early seeding tends to produce higher yields and this can vary obviously by um, regions across the state whether you're in the southwest part of the state or the northeast generally late april to mid may uh, would be an optimum in a lot of instances but that can vary and basically you're trying to avoid high temperatures during flowering if you plant too early you could get increased chance of stand loss some of this is because of cold temperatures canola um <clears throat> germany it's about 40 degrees but if you have um, cool days and, and cool nights it's going to take longer to emerge it may take up to two weeks and at that point you could lose some of your insecticide effectiveness um, for flea beetles so you like to have temperatures that are probably greater than 50 degrees and good to quote i guess would be the best management practice is the seed when the soil conditions and temperature allow for rapid germination if you can get that canola up in a seven to three days seven to ten days it'd be about ideal um, quick look at some um, planning date data that was done across the state. This was at Langdon back way back in 2011. May 9th was the first date. It was a wet year that year, so this is probably some of the earliest canola in the county. These pictures were taken July 14th, so you see planted on the 9th. We had it was done flowering by July 14th. May 19th, probably a little past 50% bloom. June 3rd is coming into full bloom. Ninth starting to flower and had no flowering yet at June 16th. So seed yield across five um, at five seeding dates across four locations at uh, Carrington had the highest seeding rate when we planted um, up to about May 12th. Henninger uh, end of April and uh, dropped 25 percent mid May. Minot was the highest at least in that year. Um, May 12th and Langdon was actually a, a pretty flat about uh, you can see 
anywhere from 83 to 100% across the years we looked at it. Another graph from Line It would show in uh, 2010, we actually had the highest yield um, in the third date. In 2011, we increased all the way to the last planning date. And then in 2012, we had pretty good soil um, rain or rainfall during uh, June and July, but the soil moisture was still uh, not up to probably what it should be. And it got drier as we got into August and you see the yield did decrease and we had yield reductions in that particular year. A couple of slides would show that of course the line is pretty flat at Langton, whether we plant towards the end of April or June 16th. Or if you look at Minot, or this could be for uh, Carrington, Henninger, Wilston, once you get past May 12th, yields drop off quite dramatically. Heating rates, <clears throat> canola is very resilient plants, so we can plant over wide range uh, and have a wide population range and have very little effect on the yield. Under average conditions, about 68 60 to 80 percent of the seed will produce a viable plant. So the objective is to obtain a plant stand of anywhere from about five to eight plants per square foot. You get greater than 95 percent yield potential. Three to four, about 85 to 90, and less. Two to three, about 60 to 80. So the biggest thing here is plant uniformity, especially you get down to two or three or even three or four, how uniform are those plants across the field? If you have big open spots, obviously you'll have to consider some um, plant re or replanting options. Plants at five, five plants per square foot, you, you get some uh, more branching, so that how it compensates for the yield. If you were at one plant per square foot, you see a lot of branching on one single canola plant, but it still would not be enough to uh, Compensate in that little population. This is a graph from uh, Canada, 85 site years over uh, many years, and basically saying again, five to eight, you're going to get your optimum um, yield. Three to four, you still could get very good yield. You get below that, depending where you are on the curve, it could drop off quite dramatically. And again, a lot of that has to do with the uniformity that we're seeing across the field. Heating rate then, this is from Langton last year, so we're looking at um, our variety trials. And we had a range, at least in seeds per pound, from 141,000 to 63,000, average about 97,000. So if we planted at 10 seeds per square foot, um, we need about um, 3.4 pounds for the smallest seeding rate, up to 7.8 for the large, an average of about 5.1 pounds. And Liberty was checked on the seed prices just recently, and Liberty is a little bit higher seed prices. So the average, about $82 an acre, we'll round up with 66. But you can see if you had large seed with Roundup or a Liberty Link, you know, you still want probably want to scale back because you'd be up to about $120. And on the other hand, if you had plant 5.1 and you had very small seed, you're actually planting more seed than you need to. So uh, keep that in mind when you are uh, um, um, out there planting. Obviously, you get your seed in, in the fall and order your seed in the fall. You don't really know what the, the seed size will be. And some companies have gone to, uh, like soybeans, actually uh, selling seed on a per unit basis and based on seed size. A couple slides here I just want to show quickly. Seeding rate, this was done at Langdon. Uh, a few years ago, 3, 6, 9, and 12, and the average number of uh, pounds per acre you need to obtain those um, seeding rate and seeds per square foot. And the cost, of course, the, it's a little different back then. Price-wise, the seed is up, and luckily the market price is about double what it, it was in those years. But it shows kind of a general trend, what's happening. Um, you have some uh, pictures of the seeding rate here, the three seeds per square foot. And, you know, I don't know exactly what happened here, but it got the body. Uh, that would not be very good in a field situation. Six seeds per square foot plant. You know, you you could uh, that'd be very acceptable in a field situation. 
and nine as well. 12 and 15, yeah, they look good, but really getting more plants than, than you really need. On those trials, we did those here. A couple of things to point out here. Again, stand percent, percent emergence with 60 to 80%. It takes a little bit longer to mature if you have a lower yield because you have more branching. And then the yield wise, we had the lower yield at three seats per square foot. No difference between six and nine, and actually uh, 12 and 15. Some of these are non significant as well, even though we have a couple hundred pounds difference. But you figure in the seed costs in there, there's very little difference on net return whether you're planting six or 16 or 15 seeds per square foot. Uh, road spacing, we've done some trials <clears throat> looking at seeding rate and road spacing. Narrow rows, really get more uniform plant distribution, more efficient use of moisture, nutrient, and light utilization, and less plant, plant copulate competition and you also get a quicker canopy closure and, and uh, more competition with weeds early on the wider road spacing it'd be more <clears throat> provide better residual clearance um, if you're in a no-till situation you have less soil disturbance and you get more plant to plant competition so if you have a wider road 22 inches 18 to 22 you probably need to decrease the seeding rate to probably even uh, two and a half three pounds per acre so you don't have so many plants in a row and you get a delay row closure and you could possibly have more weeds and not as efficient use of the sunlight so this is just a quick picture um a six inch row spacing and those plots 12 inch that's pretty much covered by fruit flower and you get to 24 inch you have some gaps in there and you can see the soil and again, you get those uh, lower seeding rates, you get a lot of branching in these canola, get uh, right conditions. And a couple of slides here with a little higher populations, especially this one, there's a lot of thin stems in there, plants that uh, maybe not produce a pot at all. So they're just taking moisture and competing with the other plants. So uh, really um, not need a population that high. And of those studies uh, combined, from the data here, row spacing, this is at Langdon, six and 12 were uh, the optimum. And, and also uh, looking at seeding rates, um, six, nine, and 12, really not a lot of difference between the nine and the 12 or between the six and the nine. So um, we really don't need to go that high. And then you figure in a net return per acre, and it certainly flattens out where you're not seeing any differences between six and 12. And some of this row spacing, I've seen studies too, where you, for years in certain uh, conditions, you're gonna get um, 22 inch rolls, probably yielding as good as 12 inch rolls. And it kind of all depends on the year, um, but typically in a lot of crops, whether it's soybeans or canola, um, a corn even, the wider the roll, generally you don't get quite the yield on the long term as you would as in a narrow type situation. <clears throat> Couple, uh, Couple more slides here on, on canola. Um, typically now in the state, more people have gone to uh, straight cutting. It's been a lot of straight cutting more in the western and southwestern part of the state for a few years, and it's kind of uh, crept in here into the northeast part of the state. We've seen a lot more straight combining, especially combining, especially this past year. If you still swath, remember to keep some of these things in mind. If you have to uh, swath when you have about 30% of the seeds on the main stem, that's the same color. And you want to begin swathing before the optimum, which is about 60%. If you have large acreage for one variety, or you seed a lot of your acres over a short amount of time. So you're not getting uh, um, swathing too late when you maybe get some shelling. So you're looking at the main stem. When you're out there looking at and you want about 60 percent of the plant to have brown seeds or just a hint of brown and the tops and from the side branches seeds will be green but firm and obviously this is going to vary over three over uh, the whole field so you need to uh, kind of take a look at the high and low spots and pick the best time speed harvest again <clears throat> becoming more popular 
across the state. I know you get less green seed issues, you get a higher oil content, and you could have equal or higher yields. And basically, when price rate harvesting, unless they have a pot, fat resistant variety, um, it just kind of shows if you're swathing and you swath a little bit too earlier, you're going to get some of those seeds in there that have that reddish color. If you swath later, it's going to be a lot better. But if you straight cut, um, you probably won't have um, too many red seeds. And you, again, you're going to have the higher oil content and probably yield. So you can either let them um, have natural dry down, which we uh, see quite a bit of, or you can use the pre-harvest aid like Reglon and spray that when about 80% of the canola is in the brown stage and about anywhere from five to 14 days later you could harvest. Uh, you could use glyphosate in the Liberty crop for weed control, get some of the weeds out if you have those, or you could use glyphosate sharpen um, combination as well. But if you have uh, some excessive lodging, you may want to consider still um, swathing that crop because it's hard to get some of those um, reglon or some of those down into the crop canopy. So that's all I have for you this morning. It was uh, good visiting with you. I hope you uh, picked up a few uh, hints for this coming year. If you have any questions, feel free to call me at the Langdon Research Extension Center. Thank you very much.